one of the striking things about Dante's Divine Comedy is that God often hides in plain sight. The divine transcendence, at least until right at the end, is so imminent that it almost disappears in the characters and events that Dante meets on his journey through heaven, purgatory and paradise until the Imperium there right at the end. And I think this is hugely significant. This is not God as a friend who shows up when things get bad. Neither is this God as an intervener who causes miracles to happen on occasion if you're lucky. This is the sense that all beings are already always founded in the divine being. And it means that lots of different beings can speak to Dante of God, and not least lots of the women and female entities that he meets on the way. And so Dante's Divine Comedy is a wonderful text with which to contemplate the divine feminine. I'm going to do so now using Eric Neumann's classic, The Great Mother. He presents six archetypes of divine femininity and treat that not as prescriptive as sometimes archetypes are treated. The idea is that they're maps to reality rather than reality itself. So one mustn't be too concrete and literal about it, but use these archetypal forms as springboards through which to experience more deeply, in this case now, Dante's various encounters. As Camille Paglia puts it in Sexual Persona, Neumann's book is a visual feast in the way that it opens up reality to us and also presents a universal way of encountering God because every human being has a mother. And so, particularly in times of crisis, that early female presence will be invoked one way or another whether it's through the sense of being scooped up and given succour, um, helped into life, or the more negative experience of being failed, being left, not being adequately sustained. And of course, most human beings have experiences on both sides of that. Hence, the range of Neumann's archetypes from what he called the negative to the positive. But Dante always has this twist with the negative and the positive because he knows that evil is only the deprivation of what's good, that descent is only the preparation towards ascent, that death is actually the pathway to life. And so one of the very interesting things that we see in Dante's encounter with the so-called negative feminine archetypes is that they are precursors to the positive and in particular Beatrice, who can be both negative and positive to him. Which takes us immediately into Neumann's first character. He calls it the archetype of Kali, who is the destructive, dismembering, death-dealing female archetype. And in fact, I think Beatrice is this to Dante. At the beginning of the Divine Comedy, remember he wakes up midway through the course of our life in the dark wood, and his crisis is precipitated because he feels the beauty that was Beatrice, who woke up life within him and stirred that love which was to propel him through his life. She died. She left him. She leaves him stranded, he feels. And so diving into the darkness, the void, the nihilistic state of mind, which he sees echoing through the dark wood around him, Immediately, though, the link between descent and ascent is underlined, even in Canto 1, because Dante very quickly learns that Beatrice is also calling to him now through the female trinity of Mary, Lucia, and herself, Beatrice. But Dante can't hear this at the beginning. He only experiences Beatrice as a Carly type figure. And what's so interesting about that is that he must embrace Carly by going through the Inferno in order for that to start to transform. And I think that's also why when Dante finally does meet Beatrice at the top of Mount Purgatory, she is at first a terrifying figure to him. 
she chastises him for trying to cling to her mortal frame, her terrestrial beauty, and not realise that that was the beginning of a line of beauty that could lead him into paradise. This dynamic can be said to be underlined in the second of Neumann's archetypes, which he called the witches. Um, in traditional mythology, these would be the furies. And I think Dante meets this form in the figure of the siren, who he dreams about halfway up Mount Purgatory. And it's quite significant, I think, that this is the midpoint of the Divine Comedy, because the siren appears to him in a dream and terrifies him, even as she draws and attracts him. And it's that dynamic that is so unsettling for Dante. But that drawing and attraction is precisely what also dissolves the siren in the dream, so that when he wakes up, Virgil can say to him, look, don't worry about it, the transformation is already underway. And that polar dynamic is also present in a third kind of feminine archetype that Dante encounters, which Neumann calls Lilith. She is the ecstatic but negative anima that will pull you down into stupor rather than lift you up into life. And I think Dante sees this early on in the Inferno when he encounters Francesca de Rimini. Remember, she is the woman who fell in love with Paolo and is now caught perpetually in the whirlwinds of lust, unable to move out of her ecstasy that has trapped her rather than liberated her. But there's also another side to this ecstasy, which he encounters in the figures of Kunitsa and Rahab, in paradise. These two are women who had tremendous passions, sexual passions in life, but were able to use them as springboards into divine life. So Kunitsa is the woman who was known to have had many lovers and yet is enjoying the light of paradise. And Rahab in the Hebrew Bible is the whore of Jericho. And yet it's her lust for life that meant that Christ came straight to her Dante learns and lifted her into paradise. So you see that in these three so-called negative archetypes of the divine feminine, of Kali, of the witches, stroke furies, and of Lilith, there's already seeded the potential for liberation and movement into the positive forms, which Neumann introduces with the figure of Isis. She's the mother of rebirth, fertility, immortality and Dante meets figures who transmit this to him. One would be the figure of Matilda who's the divine woman that he meets in Eden at the top of Mount Purgatory alongside Beatrice. She's a rather mysterious figure, she tends the flowers, she can lead him through the waters of healing and propel him into his transhumanization as he steps into paradise. So she's a transitional figure, a liminal figure, a kind of guardian of the gateway to immortality, who, like a midwife, guides him through to his rebirth. I think Dante also experiences something of Isis in the figure of Eve. It's very striking that she is seen by Dante in the highest heaven, sat alongside Mary, and earlier, Dante had had it described to him how Eve was born out of the side of Adam, much as the waters flowed out of the side of Christ. And the point about Christ and Adam is that they are humanity made to know God directly. And so too the waters and Eve participate in the divine spirit, which is why Dante doesn't think of Eve as the temptress, as is often said in the Christian tradition, but as co-equal with Mary sharing the divine life, bearing it into the world. That bearing into the world is also a matter of the intellect, of understanding, an absolutely crucial feature alongside love for Dante. And so we come to the fifth of Neumann's archetypes as Sophia, of wisdom. And Dante meets several women who convey this to him. A really crucial bearer of wisdom to him is the figure of Picarda, who he meets early in the paradise. And she, in particular, explains 
this great conundrum for mortal life of how suffering can lead to God and very delicately with great nuance explains that suffering can open life up for us by helping us to realize there's always something beyond the suffering but she does so in such a way as to be clear she's not advocating masochism and she's not excusing any perpetrator of suffering on earth it's the kind of wisdom born of direct experience reflected upon sub specie eternitatis that is why Picardo is a figure of Sophia to Dante. As, of course, is Beatrice. He meets her in purgatory and she leads him through paradise. Often with her explanations, she is a great intellectual figure in the Divine Comedy, but also most powerfully with her presence, particularly with her eyes. When Dante can't bear the divine light directly, he looks into her eyes and she is able wisely to titrate the divine presence to him as he becomes more accustomed to it, as his virtues fill out so that he can reflect it more and more fully as his soul grows and becomes more and more one consciously with the divine presence. Her smile is also really important. That smile is a dynamic thing and so leads him through this transformation. And she's also Sophia because she knows when to step to one side, which she does in the heights of the Imperium. Wisdom is the attempt to articulate our oneness with the divine. And so at some point has to cease that articulation in order that it can be known in the silence, in the fullness. And Beatrice knows about that as well. And as she steps to one side, the final female figure that Dante encounters unalloyed is the figure of Mary. She is the archetype of Mary in Neumann's schema and is so because she is the human form that is also most directly and intimately aware of the divine. Her womb carried the divine, was part of her in this extraordinary meeting of the human and the divine, of the finite and the infinite. And she also knew what it was to be enwombed by the divine, to say yes to all things. And so she is the fullest realisation of the divine feminine in Dante. For all that, the other two archetypes transmit aspects of the divine as humans experience that too. Even in the dark forms, Kali, who seems to bring death but actually brings life, the witches whose spells, like the sirens, can be seen through. Lilith, whose ecstasy can lead to stupor, but also to release. Then Isis, who is the bearer of the fruits of the earth and also of immortality. And Sophia, the wisdom, the Christ, the Logos, speaking in and through all things. This pattern of separation and identification never being static but always leading back to the fullness is this other great theme in Dante and in all great spiritual traditions where the particular leads to the universal and so when understanding this relationship between the feminine and the masculine I think it's really important to remember that a feminine starting point will embrace the masculine aspect in order to lead to the completeness of the divine and similarly the masculine starting point will lead to the feminine embrace that leads to the completion of the divine awareness as well. The best known symbol of this now, of course, is the yin-yang symbol, where the one is seeded in the other. This has direct practical implications as well. Dante spent time in Rome and would have seen the Basilica of Santa Presidi with its famous triumphal mosaic of Peter and Paul introducing Praxedes and Prudentiana to Christ. It's a very vivid image of female-male co-equal leadership and I think would have particularly inspired Dante because his great nemesis, the Pope Boniface VIII, moved against that co-equal leadership very definitively in Dante's lifetime, in particular taking away the authority of abbesses who had enjoyed an authority equal to bishops. It seems to me to be no coincidence that 
within that milieu and reacting strongly against it, Dante so fully embraced Beatrice as the Christ figure that leads him to God. And this is important not just for political or moral reasons, but because God is experienced everywhere in the divine feminine. God's transcendence is the freedom to move imminently closer than we are to ourselves in all things. And so Dante's encounters with the women of the Divine Comedy are part of the golden thread that leads him to know he too turns with the love that moves the sun and the other stars.